Today, I'm excited to have Heidi Thompson here with me from Cambridge in the UK. Heidi is a self-confessed marketing geek, born and raised in Detroit, but currently living and working in the UK on her passion of helping wedding professionals grow and evolve their businesses, including, of course, wedding photographers. She can be found through her website, evolveyourweddingbusiness.com, where she shares information and guidance with anyone wanting to discover how to take their business to the next level. So welcome to Photography Marketing Masters, Heidi. It's really great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Nigel. Oh, this is great. And this is actually the second time that we've got to chat. I know I was uh, on your podcast the other week, which is uh, yes. very, very cool and a lot of fun. And I hope uh, everyone gets a turn out of that. But it, it's just great to return the favor and have you back on, on here. Yeah, I'm so happy to be able to uh, talk to you again and uh, to talk to your listeners. So today's topic is all about using your blog and email marketing to romance your wedding photography clients. And before we get into all of that, what was that sort of first spark of inspiration for you that got you interested in the wedding business to begin with? Well, it goes back actually to when I was in college or university. And um, I had started working as an intern at a nonprofit doing event management and coordination for fundraising. And I completely loved it. So I tried to explore other areas of events, got into working with wedding planners in the wedding industry realized, okay, being a wedding planner isn't for me, a little too much pressure, (laughs) but I absolutely loved it. I love everything about the wedding industry. And while I continued down the road of working in marketing in different facets, I've worked um, at startups, corporate type places, uh, educational institutions, I've always tried to stay connected to the wedding industry. And a couple of years back, I realized that there was this huge disconnect in the UK between what people actually want for their wedding and what the wedding media are putting in front of people. And by kind of trickle down what wedding professionals feel like they had to portray. I was seeing a lot of couples, a lot of my friends, when they were getting married, it was very personal, very much more geared towards who they were embodied in an event. And everything in the media was just kind of big, white, and fluffy, which isn't everyone. So I started the Alternative Wedding Fair in London to bring together these couples and vendors who were doing something different. And it was awesome. I absolutely loved it. And I started to get concerned because I was seeing these really, really incredibly talented wedding professionals who were just scraping by, just struggling. And I kept finding myself kind of coaching them on the marketing side of things. And that is when it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks that, oh, I guess not everybody studies marketing. So that's my opportunity to help out people in the wedding industry. A ton of bricks. That is a good old British expression. (laughs) You've been in England too long, haven't you? Yeah, those little things weave their way into my vocabulary. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to come after you like a ton of bricks. I remember those days. <laughs> you and I are kind of like on some, almost some kind of international cultural exchange thing, you know, where, yeah. you know, I left the UK to come to America and you, I guess they sent you over there as a sort of a hostage exchange or something. <laughs> but so essentially then what you're saying is that the wedding industry as you saw it had one idea of what they thought that brides and grooms wanted and the brides and grooms had their own idea of what they actually wanted, and there was a bit of a disconnect there, and that the the wedding sort of professionals were trying to offer things that really didn't resonate with the brides and grooms at the time. Is that what is that really sort of what you're saying? Yeah, that and the people who were offering something different because they didn't know how to market themselves well mm. were not finding ways to connect with the people who were dying to find exactly what they were offering. And of course, you know, photographers listening to this are all thinking to themselves, well, heck, I wanted to be a marketer ever since I was two. (laughs) 
So the best way for me to do that was to become a photographer so that I could do lots and lots of marketing. That, that's probably not the case. I would imagine, you know, that uh, they <laughs> most people get into photography to escape the horrors of things like marketing and sales and accounting and business and all that kind of stuff. I need to realize that, hey, they've just fallen into a little trap there where, sorry, folks, <laughs> you really do have to do this stuff. So what would you say, as you see, that the top mistakes that you see wedding photographers are making with their online marketing today? Well, I think kind of in tandem with what you've just said is maybe not doing it at all or just kind of, you know, covering your ears and going, la, 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 and just hoping <laughs> that I'm not going to do any of this stuff. Like, this isn't what I got into it to do. I'm just, people, if people want to work with me, they'll find me. That's a big one. You mean that the photography doesn't do all the selling and just talk for itself? Unfortunately not. It does go quite far, but not far enough. It's a hard lesson, I think, for photography photographers to learn that one you know is that they think well if I put enough of my photography out there for people to see and I put a lot of it out there and they can see how great I am and all that then they'll instinctively know that I'm better than the competition or that I'm what they're looking for and it really doesn't work that way does it? No, not at all. And the way I see it is, you know, it's the price we pay for having full control of our own lives and our own time and what we decide to, you know, do to earn money. You know, when you have a job, that company is selling you, you know, on your behalf. But when you're on your own, you have to sell you. Yeah, that's very true. So what's there? What, what do we have that we can really put to use to market for photographers specifically online? What are the weapons, if you like, in that, in that arsenal? Well, I think the easiest place to start is with the blog because it's probably your lowest cost, most effective marketing tool when used correctly. That is kind of with all tools, you know, if you're trying to dig a ditch with a teaspoon, you're not going to get too far, but... <laughs> Yeah, teaspoon ditch digging is not one of my skills, that's for sure. <laughs> but definitely, you know, you have so many tools in your arsenal. So you have your blog, which is kind of your home. This is where you're putting all of your original content. You have social media networks, which are what I kind of see as your outposts. So places where you can connect with people, but ultimately bring them back to, you know, your headquarters. And, you know, we have email marketing, which is so often overlooked, but is so important, especially I found for wedding professionals because of the amount of research that goes into planning a wedding. You may be researching a full year, maybe longer, before you're ready to even get into a sales conversation with someone. So if you can keep in touch with that potential client, over time, they're going to remember you. They're going to want to work with you because you've built that relationship. Now, before anybody out there starts writing an email to Apple and saying, look, this iTunes episode was marked as clean and already they've mentioned two really nasty swear words. They said blog and email marketing. <laughs> You know, this is this is just terrible. <laughs> you know, you, whenever I talk about email marketing to photographers, it's almost they they get their matches out and start lighting their flaming torches and getting the pitchforks ready. You know, because it, it, it's almost as if there's a lot of resistance to the idea of doing email marketing and. Because a lot of people just don't want to, they don't want to get started with it because they have this ingrained belief, a mistaken one, I think, that email marketing doesn't work or that they're going to come across as being seen as spammy and all that kind of thing. And with the blog, it's, well, that, that kind of entails writing and I'm a photographer, therefore I'm not really going to write or I can't write or I don't feel like I can write. And so therefore that's going to be incredibly hard for me to do. That leaves me with uh, the website and social media and maybe some other stuff like videos or something like that, which they don't want to do either because most of them don't want to be on camera or anything like that. So let's see if we can dispel some of these myths, if you like, and some of these misconceptions about blogging and about email marketing in particular. I guess we'll start with the blog. And, and I'm sure that this goes for other industry professionals that you work with, not just photographers. I'm sure this applies just equally well to cake makers and limo, limo drivers and DJs and all those other uh, great wedding vendors too, in that people tell me I have to start a blog, but how? What am I going to write about? What do I do? 
Right. That is where so many people get stuck. And what I always tell people to do first to come up with topics is sit down for 30 minutes, set a timer and make a list of the question that your potential clients ask you, of the concerns they have, of things that they struggle with, of things that they don't know about that you wish they knew about. All of the things that you're like, oh, my life would be so much easier if only people understood that they don't really want the digital files. They want an album, but they don't realize that till afterwards. That's something that you can address. But when you actually look at the questions you get, you start to see that you take your own expertise for granted. And most of these people have never done this before. Um, And if they do work with a photographer or have in the past, I mean, it isn't exactly something you do every day for most people. So they need that educational content to both feel better about moving forward with it, but also to, you know, get them more prepared to have a sales conversation with you, more prepared to, okay, now I understand my options. This is what I want. So number one thing, sit down, make a list of the questions that you get most often. I would say the the first question that's going to be on that list for a lot of people is going to be, oh, well, how much do you charge? That's not a thing that you should be putting on your blog, really. Right. And something you could kind of twist that, really. Um, You could write a post about three other questions that you should be asking your potential wedding photographer aside from how much you charge. Because the reason people ask how much you charge isn't necessarily because they're looking for a deal. They might be, but it's because they don't know what else to ask. There's no other context. Yeah. You know, when you walk up to a hot dog vendor in the street, you know you want a hot dog. And you don't walk up and go, how much is a hot dog? You go, just give me a hot dog. That's what I want. It might be, depending on where you are, the price might vary tremendously. If you're in an airport, it's probably a hundred bucks for a do- for a hot dog. If you're, you know, in the street somewhere, it might be two or three. I don't know. But, you know, with wedding photography, particularly, people just don't know what else to ask, do they? They they think to themselves, well, I know I need a wedding photographer, but I don't really know what to ask them. I guess I'll just ask how much it is. <laughs> Seems obvious, right? Yeah. And when you keep that in mind, that question becomes far less insulting than it would if you just think everyone just wants the cheapest person. It's really because I don't want to say they don't know any better because that sounds a little condescending, but they don't. Yeah. They haven't had enough experience of the wedding photography to know that there are a lot of things that they they may not be aware of. You know, it's a case of they don't know what they don't know. So the only thing that they can really think to ask to start off the conversation is how much. So I don't think, you know, addressing that question directly through a blog post is a really, you know, is a good idea. Like you say, the best way is to say, okay, instead of asking, you know, what does it cost? Here are three other things that you need to think about first. That you may not have considered. So a lot of people might not consider that actually they really want to click on a personal level with their photographer. So are there questions you need to ask to find out more about them as a person, their style? Do they like to shoot more formal, you know, all these kind of things just to make sure you're on the same page first. And once they've got that list then of, let's say, maybe 10 or 15 questions that people either ask or what the, or they should ask, what, what can they do then? What, what, how do they go about turning that into uh, a blog resource that people can use? So each one of those can become a blog post. And it's very easy to turn a question into a how-to statement. So if the question is... One that I saw one of my clients do recently. The question is, how do I know how large of a wedding cake I need? So her post was like the ultimate guide to wedding cake portion sizes that takes you through the how-to of determining exactly what you need. And so for you know, for a photographer, for example, it might be things like, what do I need to do to prepare for a bridal portrait session? Mm-hmm. How can I get my fiance interested and fully invested in the the photographic process you know and that kind of thing what do i need to do on the wedding day what to prepare for or to incorporate 
the photography into the wedding day uh, and that kind of thing. There's there's a lot of different topics that come up regularly, I think, you know, with photographers and their clients to warrant, you know, having these resources. And, uh, and so, you know, you put them on the blog and all that kind of thing. Then is it just going to sit there and wait for people to just kind of find it? How, how, how are the brides going to interact with that content? The existence of it certainly does help, but you want to make sure that you're promoting it. And I think there are kind of two camps of how I have seen wedding professionals, photographers alike, use social media. And one of them is sharing helpful, useful content that people thank them for sharing. The other is hey, have you booked yet? Contact me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one works. Yeah. Don't forget so, to book your wedding photography with us. Right. So if you are sharing this on social media, people are going to be getting value out of it. They're going to thank you. They're going to want more. And this is where signing up for your email list comes in. And, you know, you don't want to share it just once because let's say somebody follows you on Twitter a month from now. They won't have seen that post, more than likely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when was the last time you saw something come up on Twitter that you'd seen before and you just got angry and irate? <laughs> you know, like, I've seen this. How dare they not know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Why do they keep sharing the same thing all the time? You know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, for people who've already read it, they might choose to share it to, you know, their followers too. So don't be afraid to share these helpful pieces of content liberally. What about sharing other people's content too? So let's say, uh, say you come across an article or a story on CNN or BBC News that talks about, you know, what happened at somebody's wedding. Let's say they, the bride and groom made some terrible mistake hiring a photographer and it all just went completely south and went turned nasty. You know, well, hey, look, you know, here are some mistakes that some people made. Please don't do this. Uh, you know, you, you can share that with your social media audience. Uh, another one might be uh, you come across a website or a blog somewhere where somebody is showing, you know, what goes into making the perfect wedding cake and brides are interested in that kind of thing yeah it's not necessarily to do with photography but it keeps the brides connected and engaged with the social media presence rather than just going hey we're having a special on wedding photography this week or book your wedding now for june or whatever it happens to be you know and that kind of thing or you know just constantly talking about yourself that kind of thing wears pretty thin on social media you know mm -hmm. and i think it's one of the reasons really why facebook for example have cracked down on the you know showing posts from business pages to all of the fans is you know in the sense that marketers on facebook just they just kind of went on a rampage really you know when facebook uh, opened up the whole business page thing and it was like a free-for-all then everybody just kind of went nuts and just started posting all these really highly self-promotional status updates and so on on facebook and, and they just kind of went whoa you know that's not really the way we wanted this platform to be used yeah, that's not the point of Facebook. You know, they actually have cracked down again recently saying yes. that so your helpful content posts on your business page are going to go a lot further than your self-promotional ones, which are pretty much going to get stamped out because – that's not the purpose of social media. And unfortunately, people read these things from Facebook and kind of paint Facebook with this brush of, oh, they're the bad guys. You know, they, they, they're determined to just make us pay to get our content seen. And yes, they have a responsibility to their share, shareholders. It's their platform. They can do with it whatever they will. Mm -hmm. They can even shut it down if they want to. If they find, discover that one day they're rich enough and they don't want it anymore, they could shut it off and that would be the end of that. And in fact, um, I heard just the other day that the, the first hints, if you like, that Google will be killing Google Plus in 2015. Interesting. Well, all the more reason to not build on rented land, which I say your, your blog is yours. Build there. Use the other networks as outposts to drive people to that thing that you own. You've got to own your own platform on the web. 
There's, there's no oh, question definitely. about it. You know, you, you have to be in full control of it. You know, no, no more of these free websites listed, you know, that are actually hosted on a some system that you don't control and, and that kind of thing. I remember when Google Plus f- first came out, there were some very high profile bloggers at the Times that got behind it, you know, 100% and literally killed their own blogs. That's dangerous. And said, from now on, I'm just going to be posting on Google+. Plus. That's now my new blogging platform. OMG. You know, what is going to happen to them when Google+, Plus decides, you know what, we're bored with this. We've had enough. It's not serving our business needs. It's not fulfilling the purpose that we set out for it. So we're just going to kill it. End of story. And you wouldn't do that with you know, anything offline. You wouldn't, you know, set up shop in a place where, you know, you could just be bulldozed any day. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that same kind of mindset. And something you touched on about sharing other people's content, I think that's very important for a few reasons. One is that you don't want to be talking about yourself all the time, even if it is helpful content. To, you want to be thinking about your ideal client holistically. So not just a photography customer, but what other thing are they worried about? What other things are they working on? If they're putting together a wedding, there are a lot of things. And there is a big difference between someone who positions themselves as a service provider. It's very transactional and someone who positions themselves as a helpful resource. And that helpful resource, I'm not saying you shouldn't get paid. Of course you should. But people like to work with people who are helpful to them and aren't just looking for that transactional nature. So I think sharing things as a photographer that are not about photography are really important as long as you know your ideal client is interested in that. If you know what blogs they read, um, if you have fellow vendors that you have contacts with, if they write great blog posts, share those. Great way to build relationships too. Before we move off the of blogs onto the email marketing thing, let's talk a little bit about the writing part. You know, this is like the rhinoceros in the room, you know, the thing that nobody wants to do because let's face it, I picked up a camera because I'd rather do that than pick up a pen. You know, I don't want to be a writer. I'm not a writer. I'm a visual person and therefore I feel that I can write blog posts that have 50 photographs in them and I don't have to put any text in there because the photos will speak for themselves. You know, and they say to me things like, well, I'm not the next JK Rowling. I can't write very well. That right there is so indicative of the way that we view writing because I think school kills writing for us, to be totally (laughs) honest, because we've been criticized about it and judged on it and taught that there's only one way to do it. And if you write on your blog the way you wrote in school, nobody's going to read it. (laughs) Not even your English teacher. No. (laughs) So you have to write how you speak, and that actually makes it a lot easier because when I'm writing, I'm actually more often than not talking to myself (laughs) out loud as I go. I'm like, and this and this and that. Because then it sounds normal, you know, it sounds human. And I think once you stop trying to be, you know, an English major, you know, once you stop trying to be shakes. And just realize that the writing itself is not what is important. Mm -hmm. It is what it does for the person who's reading it. I remember when I first started blogging back in 2008, and I was kind of carrying over all of the things from my professional career and from my schooling and all that kind of thing. And so I had fully justified text. I had long paragraphs with, you know, seven and eight sentences in them. I I worked on the grammar, you know, all this kind of thing. And I looked at it and I thought, it's beautiful. It just looks fantastic. People are going to love this. And they hated it. That's like reading a term paper. Oh, it was horrible. I mean, I look back on it now and I just want to just put a match to it, you know. And I remember the first time that I came across this idea of being more relaxed in the writing on a blog. It's a totally different thing. Very nervously in my next post, I wrote a a three-word sentence all on its own. Yeah, sometimes I write one-word sentences. That's okay. (laughs) Yes, it is. Exclamation point and new paragraph. And looking at that and going, my English teacher would kill me for writing something like that. But you know what? 
it is so liberating and so so gratifying to not have to stick to those rules and just be able to just kind of relax and forget about trying to be impressive with the writing. Yeah, because your goal is to be helpful with it and to build a relationship with the person who's reading it. And if you want to look at the polar opposite of how you were taught in school, Google the Middle Finger Project. She is a copywriter, and she's a fantastic writer. (laughs) I can only guess what that's about. She's hilarious. Like, she's just totally herself in her writing. And I have no doubt in my mind, if I were to meet her in person, I can predict exactly who she would be based on her writing, based on the fact that she swears in her writing, the fact that she uses giant green heading text in the middle of a blog post to get across a point. But that's the thing is you can do it any way you want. You know, if we find ourselves at a party somewhere and cornered by somebody who talked in the way that we think that we should write, (laughs) we'd want to poke our own eyeballs out after five minutes of listening to them, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, if you do struggle with actually writing how you speak, it can be helpful to just record yourself speaking through a topic. Yeah. And either, hey, you could always publish that. You could get it transcribed. You could just listen to it and write from that so that you can actually understand how you want to sound. For the folks out there listening to this, you know, would you rather me and, you know, Heidi and I just sat down and we, we scripted out this whole conversation word for word, you know, from the very beginning and that we're each sitting here with our own little sort of screenplay script, you know, and we're reading our lines and, and all that kind of thing. No, it, it, it would sound terrible. Mm-hmm. I lost my script anyway. The dog ate it. <laughs> Typical. So anyway, so I'm kind of winging it, you know, as you can probably tell. (laughs) But that's good. And that's natural. And people want to work with people they like. And you can't learn to like somebody until you learn who they are as a human, not who they are as this weird, stodgy, corporate speak kind of entity. If you hate writing, start a podcast. If you hate writing, make short videos. You know, videos don't have to be these epic masterpieces. Someone who does this very well for photographers is Alex Beeden. She does usually very short videos, maybe about five minutes, talking through a specific topic. Very effective indeed. So let's move on to email marketing, and we'll give that a go. And uh, everyone's rushing for the off button now. They're going, oh, my gosh, where's the, where's the stop button? I don't want to listen to this. <laughs> but no, email marketing it has been shown time and time again to be the uh, single most effective marketing or sales platform that we have as well as building relationships with people because it's so much more personal you know even more so than social media in a lot of ways but of course like many things it has to be done the right way and 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 so on what would you say are the biggest mistakes that people are making in and around the whole sort of email marketing space I think, well, the mindset around it is definitely something that I think people get really hung up on. And yes, there is good email marketing and yes, there is bad email marketing like anything. When you send a blanket PR pitch, when you just CC a bunch of people who never asked to be contacted, that's bad. That's real bad. (laughs) happens to me every week. Probably I would say at least three to five times a week, I get added to random email lists. And people listening to this are going, I'm going to add you to my mailing list now. (laughs) It's actually illegal, so you probably shouldn't. (laughs) This is a typical conversation that I have with uh, coaching clients, you know, is, well, you should probably start an email marketing campaign. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, why not? Well, because I don't believe in it. You don't believe in email marketing? No, no. I, well, why not? Well, because I, I, it's kind of spammy, and I, and I think nobody opens emails, nobody reads those things, and you know, people just don't want to keep getting all that email from me. Oh, I see. So you don't believe in email marketing? You think it's a load of spam, and you, and nobody reads them? Well, yeah. Okay. So how are you and I talking? How do we meet? Oh, well, I opened one of your emails, and there was an offer inside. Ta-da. Hmm. That's odd. I thought nobody read those things. Oh, yeah. yeah, Well, you're different. No, I'm not. (laughs) 
for the person listening, that's your opportunity to be the type of marketer that you would like to hear from. You don't have to be spammy. And if you focus on, so something as simple as emailing out a new blog post that you've written that you know is going to be helpful. So let's say you have your email list and you write a blog post each week. Each week, send an email with a blurb about the blog post, a little teaser, a link to it. And you can also make an offer in that email. That is helpful. It's effectively delivering helpful things to the person's doorstep instead of making them go to your blog to get it. And why wouldn't you want to help them by delivering the content to them? And, and, and another thing that I hear a lot is, well, you know, I, I, I would start a email marketing thing and send out a newsletter, but I, I tried it once and I, I wrote two issues and then I, could, I ran out of things to write about. Yeah, that's another thing is you have to be strategic. You have to plan these things out. So your email marketing has to have a purpose. If that purpose is to, let's say they sign up and they get a couple automatic emails with tips, and then after that, they get your weekly email with your blog post. Well, you need to schedule that content creation. And I should point out here that consistency is way more important than frequency. I sometimes get people who say that they want to blog every day. And they're going to email people every day. And it's like, you're going to burn out, let's be honest. But knowing that they can expect it every Thursday, that is a lot more powerful. And it makes you look more credible. It makes you look like more of a professional because you're taking your business seriously. You're planning this stuff out. Nobody wants to work with somebody who can't even have the foresight plan out something in their own business. Why would you trust that person with your wedding? And of course, we have this idea of newsletters, you know, and nobody wants to get another newsletter. What I found really interesting was some of the research that was done. I think it was by HubSpot, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. But basically what they found was that people are so much more responsive to emails that look like just regular text emails Mm -hmm. Rather than emails that look like you've just been sort of visited by a graphic designer, you know, and have all these fancy banners and images and flashy things and little boxes and so on and so forth. Um, because those immediately, when you open them and you see that uh, little thing at the top that says, having trouble viewing this email, click here to see it in your browser, you know that that's going to be like a, a newsletter type yeah. thing. And it's all fancy formatting and little pretty colors and boxes and stuff. And it instantly creates this uh, idea in your mind of, oh, this is a corporate type email, they're probably going to be trying to sell me something. You put your guard up. Whereas, you know, when you write to your friends, you don't send newsletters to your friends all nicely formatted. You go, you know, hey, Jill, how you doing? <laughs> you know, found this last week. I thought you might like it. It sounds kind of interesting. Check this out. Right. And actually, it's funny enough because I sent out an email before, like right before we got on this call, because I have my Book More Weddings Academy course launching in January. So I sent an email out to my email list, quick couple sentences, pretty much saying, hey, what are you struggling with most when it comes to booking more weddings? Because I want to make sure I address this for you. Since we've been on this call, I have gotten 17 responses to that question. Wow. Right? It's just because it's simple, it's straightforward. I'm looking to help you. And people respond to that. Yeah. And if you write a post and you email with that post, you, you know, even if you said something as simple as, I wrote this post for you because. I know so many brides and grooms struggle with X, Y, Z. People are going to eat that up. You are helping them. And I think, you know, there's two ways to market. There's marketing by jamming things on people's throat. And there's marketing by genuinely helping people out. And then it's only natural that they want to work with you. I mean, this is why the old system of peer recommendation works so well. 
mm -hmm. know, I need such and such a, you know, a job doing, you know, talk to my buddy. Hey, Bob, do you know someone that can do this type of work? Well, hey, yeah, I, I, you know, we had somebody come in and, and do the same thing for us. It was Acme, whatever, you know, plumbing company or something. And they, they came in and they were fantastic. You know, they, they cleaned up after them. They were professional. They were nice and they did a great job. And you almost feel like you already know that company because of the association they had with a friend. That's that's one way. But of course, you know, the by sending emails out that connect with people and engage their interests and talk about their sort of common challenges. Because yeah, I mean, people think, well, they're brides, they don't have problems. There's no challenges or problems. Well, there sure are. You know, but you ask any bride that's trying to plan a wedding if it's plain sailing and she's having a marvelous time at it. Most of the time <laughs> they say, heck no, it's really stressful. You know, the, the mother-in-law's playing up. The bridesmaids are complaining. The, you know, the every, everyone's, you, you'd think we were trying to plan a war instead of a wedding in some extreme cases. Yeah. Uh, and they find it difficult. And, and so, you know, just by sending a simple email out that says, you know what, hey, what, what are you struggling with right now? What's the thing that's given you the most aggravation, you know, planning this wedding? You know, the next thing you know, you've got a whole bunch of responses. I think it was uh, Zig Ziglar who said, I guarantee if you want a conversation with somebody, just walk up to a random stranger in the street and say, hey, I heard about your problem. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> he said you won't be able to get away because they'll be like, "Really? I can't believe that this happened." You know, blah blah blah. And the next thing you know, you, you've you've spent the next hour talking to them. I don't recommend that people do that, by the way. It's kind <laughs> of creepy, but uh, but you know, it, it does. It, it just illustrates, you know, that if if you show people that you sympathize and empathize with their problems and the challenges that they're having and you offer them solutions or even if you can't offer a solution offer some kind of anecdotal thing that makes them feel better about it yeah and actually it's been found that you know as a human we need certain things right we need food we need water we need shelter but one of the other things that we really crave is to be understood and to be heard. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that for someone and you can be helpful with your marketing and you can still make money and run a business you love, that's win, win, win. Absolutely. And, you know, marketing these days, I think that the, the sort of the, the, the buzz phrase, at least I first encountered it, which and I'm always late to the party. So, I mean, it was probably around before then. But I would say probably around about uh, 2008, 2009 was when this no like and trust factor thing started to become in vogue, you know, everybody was going on about, oh, you got to get people to know, like, and trust you, and uh, and that kind of thing. But it is absolutely true. It's funny because you know, like Dale Carnegie was talking about that in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. See, I told you I'm late to the party. I wasn't around then. <laughs> But that's the thing. That's what's amazing about his book, which is called How to Win Friends and Influence People, is that everything he wrote almost a century ago still applies because it's just basic, it's super simple. And your marketing does not have to be some insane convoluted thing. If you just focus on helping people, answering their questions, and positioning yourself as a solution to those problems, you're going to be a lot better off. And I would probably add to that the idea that get rid of this instant gratification need. You know, I'm not known for being one of the most patient people on the planet. I don't think that uh, if I, in my drawer, I don't think I have any patience awards or anything like that. I, and and so, so I tend to be of the mindset, like, if I do something, if I take an action, then I want to see the result. You know, I went to my physics class, you know, cause and effect. You take an action, there's a result. You poke someone, they hit you. I mean, that's a you know that's, that's kind of how it works, right? <laughs> they don't wait till next week and hit you. Well, they might, I suppose, if they're particularly vengeful or something. But with marketing, you take an action, and it can be a little while before you see the result of that. Especially if you're doing content marketing or blog marketing or email marketing to an audience that has a long sales cycle, like weddings. Yeah. A lot of times, the best clients, the ones who pay the most, are usually the ones who plan their weddings longer. They'll start 12 months, two years ahead of time because they want everything to be just perfect and they want to make sure they get the best people. And so you could be 
talking, you know, to someone without even realizing that they're there for a year. Mm -hmm. So that marketing that you put out isn't going to have the instant gratification thing. Yeah, I think there are a couple ways to look at that. So if you're looking at one specific person who's just come into your world, then yeah, I mean, you can't try to get married on the first date. That's crazy. But there are also people who have been reading your blog posts without you knowing it and who are pretty much ready to work with you right now. You can also look because, you know, measurement is important to see how your blog posts are doing. Look in your Google Analytics, see what is more popular, which of your blog posts are most popular. That tells you something about your audience and it tells you the type of content you need to be creating more of. So if they really resonate with one particular topic, run with it. Same with email marketing. You know, you see people opening them. You see, well, you don't actually see that would be weird, but (laughs) you get the data. (laughs) You know that they're going through and reading your posts because you can see the number of people that click through. So you, yeah, you can look at the numbers piece, but Sales cycles are important because for a lot of things, people are not ready to just go buy something the way they would buy candy bar. And that's where email marketing becomes really valuable is because what I always say is that sales is a lot like dating. So if you can't get married on the first date, how do you prevent this person from just leaving your website and never you know, contacting you again or thinking six months from now, oh, I really like that photographer, but I can't remember what his name was. Well, you have them join your email list. You offer them something in exchange for their email and you effectively go on little dates by sending them emails and allowing them to get to know you and get to know what you're all about. Because believe it or not, I mean, it sounds a little like woo-woo, but that matters a lot more to people. People want to know the human being that they're working with. And more so than ever before. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the way I look at it is without an email list, it's like you have to get up every day and start your business all over again from scratch. Yeah, you do. It's like, I guess you could kind of equate it to like you have to get up every day and go fishing as opposed to these fish that you have in your pool Mm -hmm. that you know they're there and you can go contact them whenever you want. As weird as that sounds talking about fish, but (laughs) you can go feed them. (laughs) Fish fish are cool. I worked with fish for quite a long time. (laughs) They're really cool tropical ones. (laughs) Yeah, they never talk back, you know. But you better believe that they're going to like you. You know, something that's kind of funny that you will find as you build your email list is there will be people who are on your list from day one and they've never bought anything from you. But oftentimes they are your biggest cheerleader. Mm. They are out there telling people about you, sharing every single one of your blog posts. And that is just as, if not more valuable than a single transaction. You're right. I have I have people on my email list who have never bought anything from me, and that's fine. You know, they've never come to me for coaching. They've never bought one of my courses or anything like that. But they share every email that I send out religiously. It's so funny. Yeah. And I think, who are these people? What what, what is it? about me or or them that makes them want to do this because I've never met them. I have no idea really much about, you know, who they are or what they do, but they just share my stuff religiously all the time. And I thank them for it and I'm very appreciative. I had my first lesson, my first sort of object lesson, if you like, in this um, when I one day got a phone call from a a mum who wanted her kids photographed uh, and she said to me because I was that very morning I was thinking to myself you know this email marketing thing is just kind of hard and I, I just not really sure it's working and as luck would have it the phone rang and this lady goes hey I'd like to get my kids photographed and you know I've been on your mailing list for some time and I've been getting your emails for you know maybe the last year and this last one I got you know I just thought to myself you know what I'm going to do this I'm going to go and get my kids photographed and and she'd been literally lurking in the background quietly kind of getting to know who I was and what I did and I guess it kind of built up that little sort of sense of urgency for her to the point it reached the point where she couldn't ignore it anymore and just wanted to do it it's really interesting how those things do come out of the woodwork and you realize 
what you've been doing actually is working and you may not be aware of that. Um, one of my clients who is a cake maker said that she, she sent me a message saying that she booked a client based on her blog, but from the most roundabout way ever. And it was an after kind of comment after they had signed everything in a sales consultation. Uh, and they said, you know, one of the biggest reasons we decided to work with you is because of your blog, because everybody else that we looked at just talks about themselves and, hey, look, I baked a cake on their blog. But you, you show a true interest in helping the people that are interested in working with you and are working with you. And so we thought you'd be that kind of person. You are. So let's finish up here and summarize, you know, some of the things that we've talked about uh, just to make sure that we've got everything clear for people. We talked about the blog and how important it is to have one and and how important it is to write that in a very conversational way. Don't be frightened of writing. Put Use actual words and cover those resources that people want to know more about, for one thing promote that stuff through social media and then with the email marketing don't look at it as being some kind of spammy thing that nobody ever reads but make it something useful that will engage and connect with the audience be consistent with it and we didn't talk about the frequency i think there's there's this kind of idea that it's a sort of a almost an accepted standard of the monthly newsletter and i happen to think that that's really too long to go between emails i do too i do yeah i do weekly and just a tip for you listening it's okay to use the word newsletter when you're talking to nigel when you're talking to me never put that word on your website ever yeah it's a bad word it is (laughs) it's a bad word don't use it uh so and what about getting people on the list we didn't really talk too much about that but people are just not going to go hey here's my email address add me to your list so the way I see it is it is a transaction and, and it, a transaction is simply an exchange of value. They're giving you their contact information. What are you giving them? Well, we can go back to the things that they are most concerned about, that they need help with and put together a resource like 10 steps to planning your wedding. If you're, what I often recommend is look at where you are in the process, like for planners and photographers who are towards the beginning, something about keeping, you know, your timeline together can often be helpful. Um, five things to consider before booking your wedding photographer. All of these kinds of things, you know, that it could be a PDF, it could be an audio, it could be an ebook, it could be absolutely anything. But you want to provide something of value in exchange. And that doesn't have to be anything complicated, no. right? It can be just a simple one-page checklist. Yeah. As long as it's valuable. That's the key thing. It's got to be valuable. And in a lot of cases, making it too long can be a disadvantage because then people just don't want to read it if it's too big. That's very true. You know, so keep it short and sweet but valuable. All right. So my last question here is always a fun one. So if you could go and knock Doctor Who on the head and steal his <laughs> TARDIS and go back in time to when you started out in business, what would be the advice that you would have for your younger self that others might be able to learn from? I think my biggest lesson in business has been that failing isn't something to fear. It's actually a good thing. And the first couple times, you know, I had launched something and it went awful and it was just, oh, the world is ending. But then you realize what you usually make failure out to be is much worse than what it really is. And all it really is, is a learning experience, tells you what to do and what not to do. Exactly. You know, failure is a good thing. You know, it feels terrible, but you look out the window and the world is still turning. People are still walking about, going about their business. The sun hasn't fallen out of the sky. You know, tomorrow's another day and just learn from it. Yeah, great. Great point. And if you can just keep the perspective of, I mean, of course, we all take things personally. Our businesses are very close to our hearts, but just like, okay, that didn't work. What am I going to do next? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I go through this process all the time myself. You know, well, that didn't quite work out as expected. And yeah, I mean, do I not take it personally? 
No, sometimes I do. I'm, I'm human, just like everybody else, and it hurts my feelings when people don't invest in things that I think are going to be really good for them. But it's only temporary. You kind of feel bad, and then you, you look at it, and you go, well, you know what, I, maybe I should have done it this way, or maybe this is better, or maybe I didn't communicate it right, or what, for whatever reason. And you just pick up the pieces and move on, you know, and you do something different. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy you said that. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, failure is not the end of stuff. It is not. Quitting is. Quitting is the end. That's the end of the road. But failure is really just another way of discovering which way you need to go next. And there's actually a quote that comes out of Silicon Valley, and it's, fail often, fail fast. To get it out of the way, because it's going to happen. So you may as well learn in the beginning what works and what doesn't work. Fantastic. Well, Heidi, this has been wonderful. It's been really, really a fun chat. I I can't believe how quick the time has gone by. We've been talking now for nearly an hour already. I I just looked at the clock. It was like, wow. Uh, So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come on here with us today and for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and your wonderful sense of humor. And it's, it's it's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And uh, I'll make sure as well that folks have a way to get in touch with you through the show notes and all that kind of thing, because I know that you've got some great resources that uh, people would be able to get some great benefit from as well. Yeah, make sure we link up to them. Thank you.